Yo. Hey. Can you hear me? You listening to Hashtag. W-A-W. What a week. What a week. Hey, Tom. Welcome to another episode of Wow, What a Week. We continue on the series of me hanging out with some of my favorite people. You know, we'll do interviews of people that might be of interest to the general public, but we'll also want to hang out with people that personally for me have either impacted that industry or impacted me personally. And one such fella, incredible radio guy, amazing voice, nice guy, married in secret during COVID, <laughs> representing Dube Soweto. Please make some noise for Mueti. More flavor, Tiki. But, but you also changed your name, though. Yes, I did. But so, we'll, we'll get to that. We'll get to that. How are you doing? I'm good. How are you, Tato? You know, it's weird when yeah. I call my people by their nicknames. <laughs> like, I, I, I feel like saying, so, how are you doing, more flavor? But it feels weird. <laughs> but you never call me that. It's like when my dad, if my dad was to call me DJ Fresh, it would feel so weird. <laughs> <laughs> I, know, I totally get it. And I think um, it depends on, you know, the moment. It depends on the occasion. But you never call me by the stage name. It's always Mweti. Exactly. Yeah. But then I get Mweti, then we're diluting the stage name because the brand is here right now, not Mweti. Yeah, but I mean, I think the essence of it is just a reflection of the connection that you have. Absolutely. And, and the, the relationship that we have, you yes, know, sir. so, yeah. How are you doing, yeah. my boy? I'm good, man. And you? I'm, I'm rocking. Yeah? Driving here. What were you listening to on the radio? Funny enough, I was actually listening to Tibos on Kaya. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, one guy that I respect so much. Yes, sir. He still got it. Now he's uh, incredible. In, in terms of radio, yeah. just his ability sure. um, to really get into great conversations. So because, you know, I'm not on air mm. right now um, on, my, on my slot, then sure. I thought it would be great to flick through. Oh, yeah, to see what you're up against. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Oh, no. what, what? <laughs> How, how do you go up against 50 years of radio broadcasting experience? No, no, not even up against. Just what are people's options when I am on air? Absolutely. You and it's very I mean? important to do not that. Not that we're Oh, no, 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 no. Exactly. No. Yeah. And, and the thing is, it's important because it's good to see how people are doing what they do. Absolutely. No matter how experienced they are or how yeah. new they are in the industry, it's always mm. good to hear what other people are doing on air. Because for me, a day off is an opportunity to literally every 10 minutes listen to another show yeah every 10 minutes it's, it's something that i always tell um you know young people or, or students or people who are new in the industry sure. that you can't just listen to the station you work for absolutely and there's no crime in, in flicking through because essentially it's one big market dude i'm sure at coca-cola once in a while they sip a pepsi <laughs> just to see what it tastes like and to see what they are up against. <laughs> exactly. So I think it's always important. But also the enjoyment of radio. Yes, sir. Right? Uh, I enjoy uh, listening to different shows. Um, yeah. I remember when I um, left Metro on the breakfast show and I was telling Clement uh, sure. Maniatella at 702 that, ah, oh, man, yeah. I'm not going to be able to tune in anymore, you know, because we're on at the same time. So Dude, I'm a Clement cool. fan. Yeah, I'm a Clement yeah. fan. And, and unfortunately, I, li I do listen to you, but you're up against Clement. <laughs> and and, I'm a, and I'm a, because I'm a talk show freak, yeah, you know, Clement often wins the battle, but I do tune in. Though. Yeah, you're not a four so songs in a row freak. <laughs> <laughs> that, that 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 housewife program. <laughs> no, but also when I, you've been there at nine four seven, so Absolutely. you know their songs. You're Absolutely. fine. <laughs> yeah, because it's gonna feel like a network. Now I must do a link. <laughs> <laughs> I, I totally get it. But I think it's interesting because for, for music radio people, yeah. um, in my experience, I find that it's so important to listen to a lot of talk radio. Sure, sure. Um, you know, even in the times when I was either in the afternoon or in mm, the morning mm. at Metro, I would always switch uh, sure. from, you know, Reedy to Eusebius mm. um, and many others, including Clement. So it was always just so important to flick through. I remember when I was doing the drive show at Y, uh, 97 to 2002, mm. we had a talk segment um between four and four twenty. Bob Mabena never missed the talk segment because he said for him it's an opportunity to hear young people talking. Yes. So he never missed it. Yes. Because it was like the rest of it is fine. You know, do your thing. But uh, when it comes to talk, I want to listen to young people speaking. Yeah, and that speaks to the, the, the purpose 
of radio, yeah, right? It gives yeah. you insight into what people are thinking. Absolutely. So I think it would be very uh, myopic for, for us to assume that, you know, all views by a nation exist mm. purely on one station. Absolutely. Yeah, yeah. So what's your typical radio listening habits on a, on a typical day? What are you listening to? So um, I'll, I'll tune into Anel in the Club on my yeah. way to work. Sure. Um, I think it's a really great offering. Uh, and then if I feel like hearing what uh, Cizwe and Sola up to, then mm. I'll, I'll, I'll flick over that side. Okay. Um, and then if I really want to get a sense of, you know, the harder stuff in terms of news and current affairs, sure. then I do tune into Bongani being one. Sure. Um, and, then, and then it's my show. Mm. Then I'll tune in to Relebukhile Mabocha, who's sure. on 702. I mm. really love her show from mm. 12 to 3. Um, and then... One, one to three. Yes, one to three. Yeah. Because <laughs> there's a one hour show that, that um, uh, Mandy Wiener needs to do. Do you know that I've not missed the midday report in 20 years now? I, I can understand because at some stage it was Stephen Kuretis who was uh, doing yes, that show. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, yeah. yeah, immaculate, brilliant. And then I think in the afternoon, I'm a little bit more sort of all over the place. I think mm. I've, I, I switch around more in the afternoon, okay. depending on the vibe. So, yeah. Yeah. Who's winning the afternoons right now, in your humble opinion? So if I'm looking for news and current affairs, yeah. I would say it's 702. I okay. really enjoy what uh, John Pullman is doing. Mm. Um, and Dr. John, as an old Madala as he is... Yeah, he but, kicks butt. Yeah, and, and, yeah. and it's strange because... Seasoned, seasoned broadcaster, journalist, exactly. Lili Taima. And I think it's the people around him that kind of um, help in that, right? In making him relatable, not just to people who are in his school, exactly. but even to people who are outside of his school. So yes, from a current affairs point of view, I really think he's he's kicking butt and mm. I gravitate towards that. Also to catch up on what's been happening throughout the day. To get a sense of the day. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. yeah, and, yeah. And, and I think a lot of broadcasters, especially on the drive shows, almost forget their role. Mm. In the afternoon, you're supposed to give me a sense of what I have missed the entire day without it being too heavy if we're a music station. Yeah. A lot of shows don't do that. Yeah, but it, it, A lot it's, of shows are very self-absorbed and forget about the listener. But it's also about the, the direction. Yeah. Because if you think about it, Tato, when you are running a radio show, mm. you are, you know, controlled, managed, guided by whoever the program manager, station managers are. Mm. And they almost give you a framework in which to work when you craft your content. Sure. Now, depending on what kind of personality you are, you can mm. either be bold and say, okay, I get the framework, sure. but then I'm going to bring me into this entire thing. Hell, I'll even blow the walls down sure. and give you more than what you have expected. Mm -hmm. um, and then you also get the person who will just sort of, um, you know, humble themselves within that framework and say, they'll color right, within the lines. Yeah, yeah, I'm going to stay there because it's safer. You know, yeah. I don't want to piss off management, etc. Yeah. And to be honest, a program manager can only guide and manage you. They don't have to do the show. Absolutely. You are the one who needs to do the show. You mm. are the one who needs to create a great radio uh, content for those hours that has impact, that's memorable, all mm, the things that we mm, want. Yeah. Mm. And, and that is why there's a handful of guys that have done radio for as long as they have, mm. because they get it. Everyone else comes and leaves because they don't get it, I believe. Yeah, the longevity thing is, is, is key because um, it comes with a lot of learning. Yeah. And if you don't want to learn new things, new ways of doing things, mm. challenging even your own beliefs about how to do stuff, then... Yes, then you're never going to have that longevity. Mm. Um, I love the fact that radio does give you a, a sense of longevity. Yes, sir. The flip side of the argument is when people say, yeah, we need to hear new voices, mm. right? But whose responsibility is that? Absolutely. The, the person who has mastered the art of longevity mm. cannot be criticized for there not being new voices. Exactly. Because that person didn't put themselves on that slot. And, and on top of that, and I, I often lament how, I don't know if it's a black thing, that it's almost like in the arts, we're not taken seriously. Because it's the only industry on the planet where you'll hear people say, give other people a chance. That time it's your chosen career. <laughs> it's your chosen career. Your father is a teacher until they're 65. Yeah. But you want to tell Mueti that give other children a chance as if his career doesn't deserve for him to go until he's 65. Like, make it make sense. Yeah. Uh, it, it's interesting. Huli uh, Ravel, I love it to bits. And she, sure. she said something interesting when I interviewed her during my, my time at Metro. And she mm. was like, um, our profession is one of the, the few professionals or professions where experience doesn't get rewarded. It doesn't. So you could have... It's almost you're, you're like you're punished. The longer you've been in there, it's almost like you're punished and you're told, when are you leaving? When are you leaving? Other. It's like we're at the playground. Exactly. And it's, it's like now it's someone else's chance on the seesaw. Yeah, it's like the, the, the years you put in, the mileage, your, your experience, 
doesn't increase in value yes. when it actually should. Yeah, exactly. So that when you command your 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 salary, it's mm. like, yeah, well, no wonder you this is your going rate because this is all the time that you've spent in the industry. Mm. This is your level of experience. Mm. Yeah. Like, like, like the saying goes, you're not paying for my three hours on air. You're paying for the 30 years I've put into it. Absolutely. That's what you're paying for. And you often find that a great radio show is not always about, you know, what you created on the day mm. or the day before when you were prepping. Mm. It's about everything else you know. Exactly. About life, about human experience. Yeah. And that is what makes a great radio show. You know what else makes a great radio show? When listen, because like I said, I'm a lover of radio and I love listening to people who make it seem so flawless and so easy. Yeah. Because then in my mind, I think maybe radio is safe after all. That, yeah, you know, some of the people who are coming in might not make it seem easy, but the simpler it sounds, it's just it's a beautiful thing. Um, it's like it's like watching a swan fly, whatever it looks like. It just looks like it's it's on radio sounds like poetry, and often it comes with the experience you talk about. Yeah, yeah, it's a beautiful thing to. I listen mean, my to. my radio lecturer uh, Ruan Fenter, and yes. I think you might know him. Um, Ruan named my <laughs> afternoon drive show the Easy Drive. You're he, kidding me. He named it the Easy Drive huh. because I told because it was the year I was finishing at Boston. Yes, yes. And I told Ruan, oh, I've been given the afternoon show. He's like, why don't you call it the Easy Drive? That is manic. <laughs> and I hadn't thought of a name yet. And I, t- I told him, I actually like the Easy Drive. I'm yeah. going to go with that. Yeah, yeah. So Ruan Fenter named the Easy Drive. That's crazy. Yeah. Um, uh, he once said to me, you know, keep it simple, stupid. Yeah. That is the principle. Yeah. And the reason for that is that if you simplify things in your execution, in the things that you're talking about, not the quality, yeah. in the way that you do it, yeah. then you simplify the listening experience. Yes. Then people have less questions as to why they need to listen to you. Exactly. Are you calm? Do you sound nervous? Are you unsure about what you're talking about? Mm. Is it even how you truly feel? Yeah. Or are you expressing the views of somebody else? Is it yeah. your producer's views? Is mm. it, you know, popular opinion? So all of that, uh, you know, is summed up for me in the simplicity of radio. And listeners can pick up whether you're genuine or not. Yes. Listeners can pick up if you're bullshitting them. Which is why I don't like it when people put on um, well, personalities. The, 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 the radio guys. I'm now the guy on the radio and I'm going to speak like this. Or, or put on the voice or put on <laughs> this perfect look of, you know, so what flawlessness. Are, so what are you saying about some of our African language presenters, my man? Look, I mean, who, 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 you know... Who speak at us? <laughs> but it's interesting you, you say that because for some reason, yeah. people enjoy that. Yeah. And I'm not one to dictate that, what that, people that, that should show, like and should not like. That showmanship <laughs> of I can speak faster than you're thinking. <laughs> you know, am I listening to a radio show? Is it like horse racing commentary? Like, yeah, yeah, absolutely. You know? um, but I think it's also got to do with the culture and I think radio has a lot to do with culture sure uh, what you have been exposed to on radio as you grew up mm. what did you grow up listening what were sure. your parents listening sure. to and that kind of um, almost conditions you to accept certain things later on in life yeah. that happen on radio to say yeah well but I mean this is this is how it's always been sure you know what I mean mm. yeah. yeah so why should we change it yeah 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 is radio broken I don't know why there is this relentless you know, pursuit to, mm. you know, uh, really drive this idea that radio is broken, mm. dead. Mm. I mean, we can look at it on so no, many No, no, it'll never die. It'll never die. But is it broken? I don't think it's broken. Mm. I don't think it's broken. Um, I think if it was broken, it would be seen in people falling off the medium in terms of listening to radio sure. less, not sure. giving a damn about what radio has to say, mm. what is on radio, who is on radio. Sure. Sure. Um, are there things that need to be fixed? Absolutely. But mm. I don't think it's it's broken. Sure. Um, I do think, though, there needs to be a sense of, you know, uh, bringing uh, fresher talent in. Mm. But also, we have to look at how we do that. And what are we looking for? In other words, in five years' time, ten mm. years' time, mm. what will the radio landscape be looking like? Sure. And what sort of personalities are we going to have on air? And would it have built more household names? Yes. Because there are a lot of people who are on radio, but a lot of them are not converting them that opportunity into becoming household names. And yeah. that's what radio has been for all these years, that these become our friends almost. Uh, Mweti raised me from crash to primary school to high school. Yeah. You know, Mweti is like my radio dad. Yes. You know what I mean? I, I almost feel like a lot of the new kids are not converting they've got the opportunity 
mm. but they're not converting it. And half of it, I blame management. That when you're poorly managed, you don't know any better. I think the, the, the idea around... You know, I'll talk about impact, for sure, example. So sure. when, you, when, when you're on radio, mm. there's got to be impact, either in the content that you have on air sure. or as a radio station, what you're shifting in Absolutely. society, in people's lives. What needle are you shifting? YFM was that. Your, you know what I mean? My dude. And, and when you talk about you know, uh, radio you know, um, creating stars, YFM yeah. created radio superstars. Immediately. I, I am fortunate enough and I'm privileged enough to be one of those people who, yes, even before I got into television, for yeah. example, mm. you know, I had already um, amassed you know, quite a following. You know, my, my name was out there just from purely being on radio. Dude, I remember the transition as myself, uh, Thomas Msenga and our DJs, we were leaving Y. Yo, we you, have to talk about that. <laughs> you were starting. You were starting. And I remember listening to you and in my head, I'm like, this kid kicks ass and he's gonna go far. And I remember about a couple of years later, I was one of your biggest fans on your breakfast show. Now, let me tell you what was in my mind. Yes, sir. I was like, oh shit. Yeah. All these guys are leaving? <laughs> when I've just arrived? <laughs> you know, why leave now? No, guys, the reason I'm here is because of all of you. It's because of you, Rude Boy. It's because of you, yes, uh, Smoo. It's because of you, Fresh. Mm. It's because of you, Unati. Bad Boy, this is why I'm here. So surely see there's an opportunity. But that bad chief died, now it's me. Oh, no, no, no. I, I, was, I, I, was, I was terrified. <laughs> because I'm thinking, okay... So, who's left? Yeah. These are the people that have always been there. Sure. These sure. are the people that built this place. These mm. are the people that built an entire culture. Sure. And showed the country mm. what South African youth culture is like sure. going forward. And what the possibilities are. And what the possibilities are. Sure. So, stepping into that environment uh, mm. was scary for me, yeah. you know, to have a couple of, um, you know, great icons on the station leave. Mm. Um, it took some time to settle because sure. naturally there's a lot of criticism to say yeah wife him is dead mm, and i'm mm. like but guys i've just arrived sure i'm doing a graveyard shift you know what i mean i'm trying to like <laughs> this is the thing i used to listen to ifm as a kid yeah. you know we used to dream of going to you know wife and bashes sure. we went to electric workshop when we were underage <clears throat> you know <laughs> like this is the thing that we've always we went to boston to study radio yeah and now that you're here and then there's this whole shift in the place mm. but eventually um it settled on me and i think when when I move to, you know, bigger shows that sure. actually the responsibility is on you and the team at the station at the time to really um, bring the brand to where it should be sure. and take it to where it needs to go. Mm -hmm. and, and, you know, I must, I must be honest, um, the, your generation is, is, is incomparable. Sure. Uh, you guys are like a founding generation. Mm -hmm. You can never compare a founding generation to any other Absolutely. generation. Yeah. Yeah. But there was a time where I felt like YFM was really strong. Mm -hmm. um, you know, whether it was because Smu and uh, Chili M were there mm -hmm. and, you know, Dineo was there and I was there and Sizwe mm -hmm. was there and Bonang was there. And, sure, sure. You know, and all these great personalities. There was a time where I really thought that YFM, you know, really had a, a, a claim again to what youth culture was all about. Absolutely. Yeah, yeah. Now, looking at the path you've taken on your career, are there any things you feel you could have done differently, should have done differently, or where you feel maybe I moved too early? I'll, I'll give you an example. Mm -hmm. um, in fact, we discussed this with Greg uh, the other day when I had him on that a part of me wishes I had given Metro a middle finger when I was literally forced from breakfast at five to Metro simply because Glenn has left. Mm. A part of me feels I should have said, actually, no, I'm not ready to leave because I just started breakfast at five. Yeah, but hindsight is a, is a great teacher, Fresh, yeah. but it's also about like, well, uh, if not now, then when? Mm. And with you, I mean, as, you, as you've always pointed out, this has been a 30-year uh, dream. This is 30 years in the making to sure. eventually get to this platform. Mm. Um, I think for me, timing was never... It, for, for instance, yeah. I, I'll give you another, mm. another example. So when I had my fallout with the SABC, mm. um, I, I remember me and you spoke on the phone a lot. Yes. Uh, yes. Sometimes you were avoiding my calls <laughs> because dude, you knew what I wanted to say. When <laughs> dude called me, he's like, yo, dude, they want me to move to breakfast. Do you think it's time? <laughs> <laughs> in fact, preceding that, preceding that, uh, and this is a very important thing. Yeah. I did not want you to leave. Exactly. And I even said to you that, look, dude, I don't know what's going on with you and management. Yeah. You know, sometimes it's a shit show. Can but you fix it? Dude, stay. 
<laughs> stay. There is no reason for you to leave. You yeah. built something beautiful because sure. um, I felt like it wasn't time for you to leave. Yeah. Mm. Um, and 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 in my mind, I'm thinking, if he goes, <laughs> I'm next. <laughs> they're gonna call me. <laughs> And, 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 and I wouldn't be doing drive uh, sure. for about three years. And you know how long it takes to really build a show, build an identity, it's, everything about it. Hence, I, I'm saying, like, I was doing breakfast at five for about two years or three years mm. when they said, we need you at Metro now. Mm. So you know that feeling. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That, yeah. Guys, I've just arrived. Yeah. Um, and, and so I think how I've always looked at it is, is it time? So mm. when, I, when I left Y, it was a very sure. interesting story, actually, mm. because... Um, I did breakfast for four years outside of all the other shows I did. Mm. And then at some point, I, I actually got tired of waking up. My dude, your breakfast show kicked so much ass. Like, I never missed. Thank you. I never, I mean, I was, I'd send this guy an, an SMS almost every day. <laughs> yeah, I know. Because you, you, I mean, you listen to a lot of radio. And mm. I know you used to check in a lot. Yeah. Um, and, you know, it, it humbled the guys. It humbled Kuto. It humbled Saul sure. uh, Penduga, who was on the show. Mm. Uh, but at some point, I felt like I was just tired of waking up. Yeah, yeah. Um, you know, and so... So I spoke to management, uh, Dumelo Diaw Munahang at the time, and I sure. said, dude, I'm just tired of waking up. Mm. And eventually the idea was, okay, go do afternoon at Y. Sure. Did that for one year. Mm. Metro started knocking. Yeah. Metro started knocking, and I'm thinking, well, I've done everything there is to do at Y. Mm. It's time to go. Sure. So in, in that moment, I felt it was time to go. Mm. But the, the story around it, and this is the thing, I'd already committed to staying on longer on the afternoon show at Y. Mm. And I'd even signed the contract. Yeah, they're like those two, three year contracts. Yeah, yeah. Just to and, lock you down. Yeah, and, and the good thing at the time is that the, the CEO, Canton Pillay at the time was was very clear on timing. So sure. towards the end of the year, speak to the DJs, oh, which, yes. is, which is what I think needs to happen. In fact, uh, there's this is bad, I don't know if it's an SABC thing, mm. Where sometimes February, you still don't know if you have a contract in March. Yeah, yeah. And you can't treat people like that. Yeah, you can't. You should not be allowed to treat people like that. Yeah. So, so YFM confirmed all business with me in October. Sure. Metro had approached me before, but then mm. they went quiet. Sure. And they would come back and they went quiet. Mm. And then come January the following year, mm. they just went quiet. And then literally in March, after I'd signed my contract with Y to stay, mm. they were like, all right, dude, here is your offer letter. Sure. I'm like, you're kidding me. Yeah. I've just signed a damn contract. Mm. Um, and, you know, I had to speak to Canton. He was pissed as hell. Yeah, I can imagine. He was pissed as hell. Mm. Uh, I'm actually thankful that they didn't, like, take legal action. Uh, mm. I think it, it, as a CEO, it was his prerogative mm. Mm. Uh, because essentially I'd been breached. Sure. So the option was stay in this contract with Y, mm. miss the opportunity to go to Metro, sure. or go to Metro, uh, be in breach and, and pray to God that nothing happens. Absolutely. And fortunately, um, Canton had the presence of mind to say, ah, just let that kid go. Mm. It's fine. But wouldn't let you do your last show. Yeah, I mean, you know, <laughs> when it's all said and done, it's fine. <laughs> he can I mean, have that. No, I, remember, okay. <laughs> I remember Moeti saying to me, dog, they don't want me to do my last show. <laughs> no, I mean, he was pissed, you know, and I, and I get it because station's planned, but there was no way, and this is the point, there was no way I was going to let an opportunity yes. to go to Metro, mm. pass by, after being at YFM for nine freaking years. Absolutely. Having done any, everything there. Mm. So so that's that's kind of the call that I made. Sure. Um, so timing, hey man, it depends. And I think what I've learned is that it's not always a, a black and white thing. It mm. really depends on what's going on in that moment. You are pretty much bulldozed into breakfast at Metro. I and, would say that. And and uh, like I said, me and you would would speak with Mweti almost every day. Yeah. Um, him saying, yo, dude, they're forcing me, man. Like, what do I say? I'm like, one of the most stressful times in my life mm. for a couple of reasons. Yeah. Because I understand what it means to do breakfast at Metro. Sure. That it's a colossal deal. Mm. That it is a huge responsibility and undertaking having to sit on that chair. In SA radio terms, it's easily the pinnacle of commercial radio. Absolutely. Yeah. And when you have management saying, we believe in you, that's sure. great. Mm. But when management says, you don't have a choice, sure. I'm like, mm. you know, mm. because the reality is it's great to believe in me and, and sure. it's a great, uh, you know, vote of confidence. But if I feel like I'm not done with what I'm doing yeah. on, on the afternoon drive, mm. then surely that should matter. Yeah. And when I was told, though, no, that Exco likes the idea, yeah. then I was like, OK, cool. Um, mm. This is actually one of those things. I don't want to sit here and say it was a gun to my head, sure. but it was almost a balance between, you know, country duty. 
and also saying, listen, dude, uh, you kind of don't have a choice. <laughs> I, I was, was going to say, you know what it feels like? It almost feels like, you know, when the mafia say, we're going to give you an offer you can't refuse. Yes. <laughs> that, that's what it feels like when you are told that's where you're going. Yeah. And then it didn't help that I'm taking over my idol mm. um, in a situation that was honestly messy. Sure. I hated everything about what was going on mm. between you and management at the mm. time. Mm. Um, at some stage, I was sitting in mm. on your show in sure. the morning. I remember. And doing my drive show for three yeah. weeks. Yeah. You know, that was such a terrible decision that I'd made. Because in my mind, I'm thinking, well, I'm judged by my show, sure. not the standing. Absolutely. So I don't want to have somebody else standing in on my show mm. that I'm being judged on, mm. right? I remember suggesting names to them. I'm like, get Fat Joe. Yeah. <laughs> My grandmother will do it if you want. I'm like, I'm like, call Anele. <laughs> you know what I mean? I was just like, anyone but me. You know what's weird, though, is when things like that happen in radio, people almost assume that it affects how we relate. Yeah, which is weird. You know what I mean? It, it's, 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 it's because it, what we talk about is not always out in the public domain. Mm, we mm. don't have to go on Twitter and have a whole banter Absolutely. around the drama that's going on. Absolutely. Uh, and it's also about respect. Yes, sir. You know, because I, I know that whatever happened during that time mm. had a personal uh, impact on you. So I sure. can't take that mm. and blast it all over social media or anywhere else. Yeah. Absolutely. Yeah. Absolutely. Why did you leave Metro to go to 947? A couple of reasons. Yeah. Um, Ravi Naidu, who was the station manager at 947, mm. Um, has always admired me sure. from my time at YFM mm. and this wasn't the first time they approached me. Dude, you know Ravi courted me at 5FM for almost 10 years. Yeah, sounds like him. <laughs> for almost 10 years, yeah, yeah. every year, yeah. Ravi would want a meeting. Yeah. There was a time he even sent the CEO on some, dude, let's go. Yeah, yeah, yeah. He's relentless. Yeah. And so that was the story and they approached me um, you know, in the latter parts of 2022 or three, I think it was. Um, yeah. And it was a few months before contract negotiations mm. at SABC. Mm. And, you know, I heard the story and I thought, all right, let me just think about it. Let me see. Sure. Let me explore in my mind how join, uh, joining 947 would fit and look like in my world. Um, but then eventually we had discussions at Metro and mm. it didn't go the way I'd hoped. Sure. Um, and then what, I felt... What, what were Metro offering? Not something that I was happy with. Okay. Yes, not something that I was happy with. Mm. Um, oh, yeah, because there was a whole big almost restructure happening there at the time, right? It, it, it's strange mm. because the one minute <laughs> you're being told by uh, management that, mm. oh, no, your show is doing great. Sure. Um, we're going to have problems come salary negotiations because mm. we're going to have to you know, give you guys a raise, yes, right? Sir. That kind of mm. level of performance. Mm. And then, you know, come contract negotiations, it's a completely different tone. Um, and, and that was that. And I thought to myself, well, you know, maybe actually, maybe it is time to take up um, the offer that Ravi has presented to me. Sure. Maybe it is time to respond to Ravi and say, okay, my guy, I'm I ready. think we're good to go. Yes, sir. Uh, this has been a long conversation over hundreds of years. I think it's time to do it. Dude, as I'm busy fighting with the uh, management at the SABC, I see Ravi's number flashing on my phone. <laughs> He's like, uh, will you come now? <laughs> I was like, dude. Can I finish my fight first? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, but look, I mean, I did that show for about four years. Yeah. Um, of course, it could have gone on for longer. Of course, Absolutely. we could have done more and more yeah. and more. But the reality is that when you're doing a breakfast show, mm. and this is very important, sure. you need to be supported mm. by management, by the station. Um, Were well, you not supported? I don't feel like I was supported. Mm. Um, and I don't know why. <laughs> Do, do you know what one of my biggest gripes with the management I worked under at the SABC is? You almost feel like there are days you feel like we're not on the same team. You're my management, but I almost feel like we're not on the same team. And, and your job should be to protect me from every element out there mm. so I can deliver optimally. But I mustn't feel like we are not on the same team. Yeah. Or that I must beg for an interview that will add numbers and value and talkability to the show. So I don't know if you felt that or your lack of support or something else. My experience at the SABC mm. and Metro in particular yeah. um, has been you do your show mm. and you go home. 
Um, I haven't had any issues with management. Sure. I don't have a single issue. I don't mm. have a rap sheet. Sure. <laughs> you know, if you go uh, to my file, I, I Lou, that is a different uh, story. That's our theme. <laughs> <laughs> if, if, if you go to the files at, at Metro, yeah. there's not a single blemish sure. on my record mm. at Metro, mm. right? Um, and that's because I keep my head down. I mind my own business. Sure. I keep uh, a great relationship with everybody, you know, if they're willing to. Mm. And that's the thing. But I do believe that you need support when you're doing a breakfast show. It's sure. a big show. Mm. It's a huge responsibility. It brings in a lot of money for the station. Absolutely. And so you can't be doing a show in an environment where you can't bring certain ideas to life. Absolutely. Because it's going to take forever mm. to turn it around and get it done. There's a red tape. That when you say, can we actually do six to nine and at five to nine because yeah. it's messing with my my personal life. It's, yeah. It's, it's becoming too much it's not physically. An it's not an option. Uh, it's affecting my mental health to sure. wake up at 3 a.m., mm. right? And that's not even considered. Sure. Mm. I mean, how can, how can that be support? Absolutely. Uh, and I'm, a, your star, a, a, I'm your star striker. Yes. Meet me halfway yeah. is what you were asking yeah. for. And, and, and the reasons I will never understand and I'll never know, and that's yeah. fine. Because what I've learned is that management... Um, is management and every manager has their own style and their own views and mm. their own vision and their own idea of what they feel management is. Sure. Um, I don't think any manager can dictate mm. your success Absolutely. Um, as a radio broadcaster. Mm. Whether they hire you, fire you, at the end of the day, it's up to you. It's what you do on the pitch. Sure. No manager can determine whether you're worth mm. 10 rand or 10 million rand. Sure. Um, and I juxtapose that mm. with what I see at 947. Yeah. And, and no, the no, kind no, of support... Prime, prime media is yeah. run like a corporate machine. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And you don't feel like we're on different teams with your mm. management. And, and, and I see that with um, Anila's Breakfast Show, mm. right? And, and, I, and I won't speak for her, but on the sure. outside, sure. as somebody who's just doing another show on the station, mm. Mm. it really looks like they get a lot of support. Yeah. And, and that is something that, as radio people, we expect. Yeah. That's how it should be. Mm. Mm. You have to support your drive shows. Yeah. You have to enable them to thrive mm, right mm. you have to make sure that they are in an environment where they are motivated sure. where they're inspired to contribute mm. and be great because if mm. they're great the show is great if the show is great the station is great and everybody wins you, you know what blew my mind to get into prime media was sitting down to discuss my deliverables never happened i've never had that in my radio career yeah. Where we're going to sit you down and these are your deliverables. Yes. And this is what we are going to put in place for you to deliver. Yes. And then at the end of the month, we're going to look at the list yeah. to see that you are hitting every box that we are paying you to hit. People don't run radio stations like that in this country. Yeah. It's the weirdest shit. And f funny enough, it's something that as a student, yeah. you know, I thought would be the case. I thought sure. that every radio station would run pretty much the same. Um, when I got to Y, you know, I had, you know, my experiences. Um, but you also can't compare, yeah. you know, a 947 to a Metro. Because organizationally, there mm. are two very different things. The SABC yeah. and Prime Media are two very different things. So sometimes <laughs> I almost say, well, why am I even comparing the two? Let me, let me tell you why, though. Because there is a capacity, though, at the SABC to run it at a prime media level, just, at a, just as a business. Mm. Let's forget the fact that one is a political animal, the other isn't. Because mm. we can't ignore the fact that oh, yeah. uh, Metro mm. is a political animal mm. um, and that the comrades will, will might have a say or two. Mm. But just that they, we're running a business here. Mm. Certain principles should not matter whether you are government or not. Mm. We're running a business. How do we support our people so that they can deliver optimally? Yeah. How do we make it such that Mueti leaves work feeling like damn, it was a good show. I had every support in place and I can't wait to do it again. Your radio show should never be a chore, ever. Mm. Because it's, it's intertwined with who you are. Yes. And that's the part where I feel at times uh, radio managers miss that. They don't get it. And I don't know if it's because some of them have never actually been on air before, so mm -hmm. they have no idea what it actually feels like yeah. to be a radio personality, mm -hmm. which um, sometimes is the case, yeah. right? Um, or that, fine, I've never been on air before, yeah. um, but let me actually spend time understanding mm -hmm. what happens in the mind and the heart of a radio presenter. Absolutely. And how can I play my part in elevating what they do for them to be great? Mm. I spent eight years at Metro. Mm. 
Mm. Not a single year I regret. I had a fantastic time there. Sure. It contributed towards building my brand. And you kicked ass. Thank you. It's yeah. a fantastic brand. Mm. Uh, it makes you touch corners of the country you have never touched in your life. Mm-hmm. Um, but it's also, you know, how you experience your your time there behind yes, the scenes. Mm. Um, stuff that doesn't have to come out on air, yeah. right? Mm. There are times when things have been so tricky mm. <laughs> and you have to do your damnedest to smile yeah. behind the mic mm. because something, you know, on the desk fucked out and sure. nobody's coming on time to fix it. Mm. Um, or that the chairs are falling apart and we've been asking for new chairs for weeks. Yeah. And if I collapse live on air because the chair broke while I was doing a link, what must happen? I think that's, I, I think that's great content. And maybe, maybe they were counting on that happening. <laughs> and, and, and I think um, when you talk about capacity, it's also about people. Right? Yeah. There are a lot of great people mm. um, at the SABC, sure. um, even at Metro, mm. who really want to do great things. Sure. Um, in my experience there, I really did get a sense of that. But I think as a radio personality, there are a lot of things that they could do better to really support their Mm. talent on air. Mm. Yeah. Absolutely. Let's talk about uh, the incident of you, Masichaba, babes. Uh, because you were very loud in your silence <laughs> when that show went down. Yeah. And, and, and I don't know which interview uh, Mas Chaba was doing where she almost felt like you left a high and dry during that incident. You know? <laughs> can, can, we, can we talk about that? Yeah, look, I mean, we interviewed Babes Woduomo because she was actually dropping a new song. Yes, sir. That was the reason why she came onto the show. Mm. Uh, Masha Van Luvu and I were doing uh, the afternoon drive show yeah. Metro. And, and, and another kick-ass show. Yeah, I know. Yeah. I had a good time there. Crazy yeah. times, but yeah, yeah memorable. Um, and so in the, in the interview, um, then the issue around the late Mampincha mm. abusing Babes Woduomo pops up. Sure. And long story short, um, Babes Wudumo then speaks about mm. her experiences and what Mambinja has done to her. Mm. Um, but the way it was done was almost as if she was led, sure. uh, almost pushed, yeah. right? Um, so that we are now going to talk about your problems. Yes, yeah. um, and, and, and basically get you to accuse somebody of something live on the radio. Sure. Now, we, we can talk about the legal ramifications from here to Cape Town. Mm. Um, but it didn't feel right for me, the direction that that conversation took. Sure. Um, I felt that, if anything, the power should have been with babes to be the one. Sure. To tell us what she wants to tell us. Give her the opportunity to want to do it. Sure. But don't put it out there for her and want her to confirm whether or not it's true. Yeah. But on the flip side of it, yeah. because I know Mas Chaba and she's sure. a good friend of mine and mm. I know her position on issues around abuse, yes, sir. right? Which are very similar, pretty much identical to mine. Mm. Um, I knew she was not going to let that opportunity pass. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> um, and in that moment, um, it was just a question of saying, am I going to say anything right now that is going to contribute meaningfully mm. to this very tricky on-air situation? Or am I going to let this thing play out and let babes speak and say sure. mm. whatever she wants to say? Mm. Um, and it divided the nation. That, yeah. that interview divided the nation. Some people were saying, you know, it was great that, you know, Maschaba called out Mambinja and she got babes to, mm. to speak about it. Um, whether or not it was on babes' term, I will never know. I don't mm. know what was in her mind. Sure. Maybe babes left her home saying, mm. I'm going to tell the world mm. about my ordeal. Sure. Yeah. But things are cool with you, Master. Oh, no, we're great. Oh, yeah. we're great. Master, Th- that moment, and I think this is where people misunderstand. Mm. Yes, she may have her feelings around how it all played out, and that's sure. fine. I don't mm. blame her. Mm. Uh, but her and I have such an incredible relationship mm. um, that she is just like a sister. Sure. Um, we call each other on a range of things. Mm. She'll ask me for something. I'll ask her for something. Sure. We talk about life. Um, mm. So you guys are cool. We are great. Yeah. Um, and I mean, I, I rate her highly. In fact, 
I met Mas Chaba when I was at ETV doing mm. Club 808, sure. um, when ETV had a music show. Mm. And she was doing a talk show on ETV. Mm. And we went on an ETV tour together with all the talent on the station. Sure. And that's how I met her. Those debaucherous tours. Yes, those debaucherous tours. Yeah, I've, I've heard of them. <laughs> <laughs> and so, <laughs> we're not going to have a talk show about that. Uh, no, no, that's another episode. <laughs> yeah, that's another episode. Yeah. But I've always been a fan of her. As a sure. television personality, she was brilliant. Um, I enjoyed her talk show on Power. I used mm. to listen in sure. and I told her so even just as a broadcaster I have the utmost respect for her I'm glad that she's actually back in newscasting mm. uh, I'm glad that she's back in the game and she really just is an incredible human being I don't even think what we see or what we hear on air when yeah. she's on air mm. is even half of who she really is absolutely yeah let's uh, move from radio because this has become a radio discussion. <laughs> <laughs> it, it's kind of difficult to have two radio heads in one room and not have like a radio 101 session. <laughs> Absolutely. Yeah. Uh, representing Dube Sueto, mm. um, how would you say Dube is responsible for the man that you are? Yo, Tato, that's where v I grew up. Versus if you'd grown up anywhere else, for, yeah, yeah. for argument's sake. That's where I grew up. Um, raised by my grandparents, uh, Melinda Tetsiki. Mm. Um, in a family that was politically active, sure. having family members that were involved in the, the armed struggle, you know, through the ANC and various uh, organizations, mm. um, having an uncle that spent 13 years on Robben Island. So understanding, you know, what apartheid is, sure. that, that formed a huge part of my understanding of South African society. Mm. Um, and growing up in a township, like any other child growing up in the township, you mm. know, um, friends that you grew up with choosing different paths, some sure. choosing crime, mm. some choosing drugs, um, but also being in the right city, mm. right? Growing up in Soweto still gave you access sure. to the big cities, the economic hubs, mm. you know, the Santons, mm. the Joburgs, the Rosebanks, the Randbergs. Yeah. Um, and so even with school, I mean, I went to Northcliffe High, mm -hmm. right? That's where I matriculated growing up in Soweto. So mm. that balanced view of society um, is something that I feel also shaped who I was. Absolutely. Understanding suburban life, mm. you know, going to school with kids who come from the suburbs, black and white. Mm. And then also going back to the hood, sure. to the realities of, you know, um, what it's like to grow up in a township. So Dube really shaped my perspective. Mm. Dube allowed me to have a very balanced view of society with a lot of great um, people also coming from there. Uh, mm. The former minister, Tokyo Sukhwale. Sure. Um, he's from Dube. Mm. Um, Dr. Kumalo has a relationship with Dube, uh, also spending some time there growing up mm. uh, as an icon. Um, so there are many people that come from there that also gave me a great sense of motivation to say, no, man, mm. you know, Dube is New York. Absolutely. You know, Dube in New York. Um, and, and of course, even with people like Magesh, you know, sure. um, of TKZ, the late. Uh, mm. so, so I think Dube shaped me in, in that way, that balanced view of society and understanding what South Africa is actually all about. Can I tell you my quick, quickly relationship with Dube? Yeah. First time I came to Joburg was in 1980. Um, I was eight years old. Right. My uncle lived in Dube. Wow. So my uncle Mu came here in the 60s and he lived in Yeovil, I think, at some stage. But I think, obviously, in the seven squatters there the, yes. on the rooftop. Yes. And then he moved to Dube. So when we came here in 1980 with my folks and my two year old sister, uh, we spent that entire week in Dube during the day and then at night we'd sleep at the Johannesburger Hotel. Wow. In Jubei Park. Yeah. So yeah. I was the First time I experienced Dube. Yeah, and then I brought you back years later. No, when, wait, when... <laughs> wait, wait, wait. So, and then fast forward grade nine. That was it grade nine? No, no, grade 11. Mm. Um, there was a school from Maseru, Machabing High School. Yes. They visited my high school in Botswana. Wow. Both boarding schools. Wow. And I made a pen friend. Her name is Puseletso. And she was from uh, Dube, wow. from uh, Putsua Street. Wow. Uh, yeah, so I had this pen friend, and all my letters, I knew her, her address off by heart. That's crazy. And I was writing letters to Dube the whole time. Fast forward, I'm studying, I'm doing first year at Boston. And a friend of mine says, she was also from Dube. 
So she's like, let's go to Josie FM and drop off a, a demo. Yes, yes, yes. So yes. took a taxi to Dube, dropped off my demo. At, so I've been going to Dube, dude. And all along, <laughs> you know, here's this little boy, Oma Minanyana. Exactly. <laughs> who will one day be I'm a sure, colleague. I'm sure I was in a taxi you were there, <laughs> playing there on the street there. I'm sure while you were in a taxi, you were sitting there by the engine there, <laughs> coming back from Carlton Center with my mother. Absolutely. So, 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 so for that reason, Dube will always have a special place in my heart. Yeah, I'm actually glad you brought up Josie FM. Him, Tucker, yeah. because Josie FM, I think, has produced a lot of great radio icons. Oh, yeah, they haven't responded to my demo. I'm still waiting. <laughs> anyway, carry on. Um, I mean, you take somebody like uh, Batukada. Oh, ah, yes. Only City FM. He yes, was a Josie FM. Absolutely. But my first he voice... He was at Josie FM when I was at YFM. Yes. Yes. My first voiceover was done at Josie FM. Oh, wow. I think I was 17. Yeah. Got there. Um, also, like, the testosterone had just I kicked in. So your voice had just broken. It had just broken. I'm like, okay, I'm going to do this. <laughs> so I get there, you know, hoping to find out what it takes to get into radio. Yeah. Sat in reception. The lady at reception ignored me for like two, three hours. Yeah. Eventually, a gentleman by the name of Mnetisi, who sure. was a sound engineer at the station. He, he lived up to his name. Yeah. You yeah. know, literally. He walked past me. He came back and said, I'm man, um, have you been helped? You know, yeah. I said, listen, I just want to learn about radio. I want to know how to get in because I'm interested. Sure. And then eventually says to me, come into my studio. Mm. We get into his studio. He gives me a script. It was a radio ad for some other Kruger coin. I yes, can't sir. even remember. Yes, sir. Um, and then I did the read. Mm. A few days later, this damn thing is on air. Oh, wow. So that was my first ever that is dope. voiceover mm. done at Josie FM. Thanks to Nate DC. What a guy. Where is he now? Um, uh, some people say he's around, mm. and I'd love to reconnect with him. Sure. Uh, I'm glad you asked me that, because I'd actually love to reconnect. But I know wherever he is, he is super proud, because from then on, I was sure. able to do so many other voiceovers. Absolutely. And actually make a bit of coin mm. while I'm at it as a student. Uh, Mutusi, if you're watching, my man, uh, please reach out to Mo Flavor. <laughs> you, you, you lived up to your name, so he'd like to... But <laughs> I want to give him the 10%. <laughs> exactly. So you were raised by your grandparents. Yeah. Uh, but you went through a process the other day mm. of a surname change yes. or a realignment of who you are. Yeah. Let's talk about that. So um, my biological father, sure. um, Major Matluaklu. Sure. Um, Is that his name or his position? No, that's his name. But funny enough, he was in the army. Oh, okay. <laughs> So, I mean, <laughs> he was in the army. Yeah. Um, um, he he, he um, wasn't a part of my life for a very long time. Mm. And as my mother, Shameti, uh, explains it, he sort of left my life when I was maybe one or two. Yeah. Um, and I never, you know, had a relationship with him or even knew he existed until I was 16. I remember I was coming back from school that day mm. and I'm walking down the road and I see this car that's parked outside our home mm. there in Dube. Sure. And I looked at this car, Tato, mm. and I'm like, my heart started racing mm. and I don't know why. Sure. I'm like, there's something about this car. Uh, the ancestors were connecting already, my dog. And as I walk through the gate into yeah. the house, mm. there he was sitting in the kitchen. Yeah. And he says to me, I'm your dad. Mm. And when I walked into that room and I looked at him, mm. I just had that didn't, didn't, didn't moment. Yeah. You know, yeah, uh, it, it was. So who's he in the kitchen with? So essentially he arrived mm. um, and my grandmother just said, I'll just wait for him here. Sure. He's, he's coming back. So a lady, where's, where's your my mom? My mom wasn't around at the time. Ah, okay. I think she was at work or something. Okay, okay. Um, and that is how he, re he reconnected with me. Now, mm. I was 13 at the time, um, mm. and I remember because I was about to go into high school. Sure. Now, having a moment like that, Tato, where you've never really known who your biological father is mm. for 13 years of your life, and that moment comes, it's just something that I cannot explain. I Were mean, you I happy, angry, confused? I broke down. Yeah. Uh, we spoke for a bit, then he left, mm. and, I, and I just broke down. Mm. Um, and... He wasn't even there to explain the reasons. He was just there to see me. Sure. Um, and from then, I then made an effort to sort of try and reconnect with him. Mm. But then the relationship was on and off. Sure. So there were times where I would see him and then there would be times where I don't see him, mm. right, for years. Mm. Um, and, 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 and that inconsistency, I can imagine, is frustrating mm. and confusing and possibly even angering for a child. 
it was confusing. Yeah. Um, and funny enough, it was about saying, well, I've got a fantastic mother. Yeah. The man that became my mother's husband, mm. uh, that did the boy my home, fantastic father. Sure. He's been my father all my life. Mm. I've got great grandparents. I've sure. got a wonderful family that supports me. They always rally, huddle, lift me. Mm. I'm complete. You know, I don't need to know who my biological father is. Mm. My life is set up. I'm fine. Sure. You know, I'm going to school. I'm, mm. I'm living my life. Mm. Um, and that was my attitude. Sure. That was my attitude. Um, not inspired by anything that my mother might have, might have said mm. or my grand. No, no, no. Mm. That was my position. Life happened. Life happened. Yeah. But then I realized as I grew older that eventually the time will come mm. understanding what it means to be an African. Sure. To be Musotu. Mm. Where I have to reconnect. Le, le lapa, la habontate, sure. mm. Because that is my blood. Those are your roots, roots. Those are my roots. Yeah. Um, and fast forward to, um, to now. Sure. Um, I had a conversation with myself over the last couple of years to say, I think it's time that I reconnect mm. with my father's side of the family. So what's the relationship been like with him over the last, let's say, 10 years? I mean, you just turned 40. Yeah, so let's so, say be, between 30 and 40 years yeah. old. So the, the part that I that I hadn't mentioned is that he passed away in 2011. Ah, right. okay. And that's an important detail because it also then, there's finality. Sure. So basically, you will never get to have a relationship with him of any mm, kind. Mm. The only relationship you will have with your father is through your siblings. Sure. Who who he raised or um, stories that mm. people share with you about him. Mm. So he passed in 2011 and, um, and so I've had to literally pick up stories about who he was. Mm. Um, but the, How did you feel when you were told that he's passed away? I was, I was honestly emotionless. Mm. And that is the honest feeling. Mm. Not emotionless because I don't care. Sure. Or I'm unmoved. Mm. I didn't know how to feel. Exactly. I didn't know how to feel. Also because there's not really a connection. There's, there's not really a connection. Mm. It's not somebody that you, that you build a deep relationship with. Mm. There are questions that haven't been answered. Mm. There are topics that haven't been discussed. Mm. So how do you feel when you hear that this person that is your parents has now passed on? Sure. I was emotionless mm. i did attend the funeral sure um and and that was it and there was a there was a certain sense of finality mm. but it later on in my life didn't stop me from realizing that i have to reconnect mm. with my father's side of the family because that is who i am how did that process happen and unfold I have to thank my family for encouraging me to do it. My mother and you know my father have been brilliant in this. Yeah. I have to thank my wife for being a, a great support in mm. encouraging me to to actually do it, mm. despite it all, right? Um, and so I had to then have conversations. In your name change, mm. uh, your wife and Bali also had to change. Get, get, yes, she did. Given the name. Yeah, 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 yeah. So, so there were many discussions between the, the Tziki family and the Matutu family sure. over this process that I spearheaded because it was my decision. Mm. But I had to consult the Tziki family sure. um, of my wishes. Mm. Uh, the Matutu family was all too happy to embrace me for sure. obvious reasons. And so it was a question of, what then needs to be done? Why? Because you're the son or because you're more flavor? <laughs> because of this. Or, or both. <laughs> now, 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 now I, have to, I have to mention this, right? I have yeah. to mention this. Yeah. Um, now that you mentioned the more flavor part. Sure. I don't think I would have been in radio mm. if I did not have their blood. Sure. My grandmother, Mkhunu mm. uh, Mantiti was on Radio Bantu. Mm. She is a radio icon mm. in terms of broadcasting in Susotu. Sure. Lisedi FM, consider her an icon. That's sure. my grandmother. Mm. She walked those halls at SABC. Um, those segregated halls. Yes. She, she was fluent in Afrikaans, sure. which is also what helped her get in there because you mm. couldn't work there yeah. if you didn't know Afrikaans. Mm. She was broadcasting on SABC in Sesotho on Radio Bantu yeah. long before I was born. Wow. Um, my grandfather, her husband, mm. um, uh, Libenya Matlutlu, was amongst other things, a composer. He wrote songs like Palafala. Oh, wow. You know, he wrote that song. He wrote mm. many songs that were sampled Not by many artists. Not the TKZ artists. Palafala, man. <laughs> <laughs> you know, carry on. <laughs> so he was um, a very creative, mm. um, 
almost like a scientist. Sure. So this thing I feel, right, this gift that I have mm. comes from... It's the Matlotlu blood, it's the as, Matlotlu as it blood. were. As it it were, comes yeah. from my ancestors. Yeah. Uh, my biological father apparently was a DJ in Soweto mm. for, you know, I have a long. Ah, so khale <laughs> So when I, when I when I look at this mo flavor thing, I'm thinking yeah. that is exactly where it's at, right? Exactly. Um, me even being at SABC, I feel yeah. was not just another radio gig. It was mm. actually a spiritual moment. Sure. Um, it was a gift mm. from my grandparents sure. to me. Mm. And so um, all of that, the sum of that was a real great motivator to say, I need to realign with my ancestors yes, on my sir. father's side. Yes, sir. I believe that to be a complete human being, mm. you need to walk on both feet. Yes, sir. Meaning you need to have both your ancestors, your ancestry combined from your mother's side and your father's side need to be a part of you. Mm. Right? So being a part of the Matlotlu family was critical for me in, in, in completing who I am. And so, so we had uh, many discussions between the two families, mm. which then so, led to the ritual. So what exactly is being discussed in this back and forth that's happening? Well, it, it's, that's a very good question because mm. it then goes back to issues around, for instance, damage. Sure. You know, was there damage paid mm. um, from the Matlutu side of the exactly. family for what um, their son has done to my mm. mother? So that had to be resolved. Mm. Then it was a question of, okay, um, hale nyala mm. mwana o. Mm. Sure. You know, what are you putting on the table mm. in terms of the Exactly. Not because we, you know, uh, no, we put him through school. It's, it's not a cash heist. It's not exactly. a heist. Mm. Yes, it is tradition. It, it's part of the process. It's part of the process. Yes, so sir. that was all done. Mm. Um, so, so what are you learning as you're going through this? Because obviously it's also a learning moment yeah, for you. Yeah, yeah. I'm learning a lot more about cultural practices. Yes, sir. I'm learning a lot more about having to be a man and that mm. one day you are going to be the one mm. who has to sit there and represent your children or sure. someone in the family. Absolutely. And therefore it is critical for you to know how these things work. Yes, sir. Because I believe, you know, the, 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 the knowledge that families have is important to pass down. There mm. needs to be a brain's trust, a, a knowledge transfer in the family. Mm. So that when you're dealing with cultural issues, yes, sir. the family is able to do what the family must do mm. and represent its children with respect, with aplomb in the most correct way. Mm. And so I learned a lot about, you know, this sort of process. Mm. Um, I also learned a lot about myself in letting go of certain things like, sure. um, you know, my father. It actually became more about my family lineage, mm. you know, than the individual ah, yes. in Major Khang Matlotlu. It became about yeah, because that. Because he's a drop in the ocean, yes. of, in the Matlotlu ocean. He's just a drop. Yes, because mm. Kim Weti Wamang, Wa Major Wa Khang, Khang exactly. Ki Major Wa Mang, exactly. Wa Libenya. Mm. Libenya, Ki Libenya Wa Mang, Wa Khang. Exactly. So I'm part of this chain. Mm. So it's not so much about my dad anymore. It's about something bigger. Absolutely. I've got kids. Mm. And so eventually, they need to know who they are. So it was very important for me to do this. What was the most difficult part of this process of realigning who you are? Having to catch up. Yeah. I have to catch up with my siblings. Yeah. I've got siblings, mm. you know, wonderful, wonderful siblings. I have to catch up with them. Mm. I have to learn about siblings that passed on. Sure. I have to learn about um, other dynamics in the family. I have to learn an entire new family. Mm. You know, I have to learn the history of the Matutus and sure. that Rabasotu mm. um, of Swati origin. Sure. Because, you know, um, the formation of Lesotho mm. was an amalgamation of different uh, ethnic groups, some sure. from the Nguni nations, the mm. Zulus, the Swatis. Sure. So my ancestor is of Swati origin. Mm. Um, Umadluzu, hence the surname Matutu. Ah. Um, when you... When you... When, when you when you it. When you it. Yeah. Um, and so that is who I am. And so... That, that having to catch up is, and it's still a process even now, mm. you know? Um, and then having to get your kids on board and having to get your wife on board and having to get everybody else on board. Mm. Um, I think it was um, quite a daunting task. And then having to remember that how partha, mm. you have to mention your ancestors, you cannot ignore them. You cannot leave them behind. Mm. You cannot say you don't acknowledge them. Absolutely. That you have to make them a part of your life. Mm. Yeah. In terms of physical rituals, what kind of things had to happen right. for this to complete? Yeah, I mean, it was an entire um, 
<laughs> ceremony. Kispan. Kispan. Yeah. You know, so we had to then um, have a ceremony where they had to then bring me into the family. Mm. Uh, we used a, a sheep. So is this happening in Soweto, in Lesotho? Yeah, so... so Eswatini. No, <laughs> no the, the, the Swati thing is <laughs> that was too, ten, ten, too ten. far back. Okay. <laughs> um, but um, this was in Fulo, Soweto, ah, okay. where, my, where my father is from. Ah, That's where okay. the Matrutlus okay. are. Um, so you never had to go to Lesotho? No, 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 stage. we never had. But, but, I, but I, I still have to. Sure. I still have to go to the place of my, my ancestors in an area called Buribeng. Sure. In Lesotho, it's in the Liribe side. Mm. Um, but um, yeah, so there was a ritual. Uh, uh, they had to um, welcome me into the family sure. using uh, Ngu, mm. uh, a sheep, to, to do the process, um, to communicate with the ancestors, mm. right? Um, and then... As, had, as all of this is happening, what emotions are you feeling? Joy. Yeah. Anxiety. Mm. I'm anxious because I'm thinking, there's so much on my shoulder. Sure. Like, did I want to open this door? <laughs> I am my mother's firstborn. Yeah. That already comes with a lot. Yeah. I'm the second born on my father's side, but mm. I'm basically an elder to all my siblings. Absolutely. So there's a lot of weight on my shoulder. Mm. There's a lot of anxiety. There is expe expectation. There is all this emotion around, okay, mm. like, am I a savior True. or am I just coming in? Or have I started shit? <laughs> 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 like, what am I? Yeah. And so that, that's the emotion. Um, yeah. So we go through this process um, on that uh, Saturday. Um, but because I've got children, because I have a wife, they mm. then had to also um, welcome them into the family. Absolutely. So Musebeti O was hung amuhela as nguanabona. Lu Amuhela, mm. my wife, Lu Amuhela. The kids, yes. Um, it also involved then being given a name. Ah, yes. So my name is Matabi. Okay. Matabi means joy. Yes. It's the, in essence. Mm. So um, Matabi is a name that I was given Kimabito that run in the family. Ah. Oh, yeah. Okay. So Kimabito Ali Loko. Okay. Uh, my wife had to be given a name. Mm. Um, she moved from being Mapoka mm. from the Tiki side sure. to Masipoko mm. on the Matlutlu side. Um, and so that was the process. Mm. Um, and it involved, you know, everybody in the family. Sure. You know, the uncles. It involved my siblings, my uh, parents. So for the work to be complete, mm. for the Spanish way, it's we are done. Mm. What must have happened? So, utlamelo re u amuhelwe kangu. Sure. So in our family, resebeta kangu. Sure. Some families work kapudi. Some will say rabata homu. For some, basutu batla homu, but meaning ngu. Sure. So, chantu belingu. Um. Twenty oje sebeti. Okay. So you have to take a bite of the, the, liver, the liver and then from chew the it. sheep from the sheep and okay. then chew it and then eat it. Okay. Uh, there has to be a ngu that is slaughtered to who amuhela my wife. Sure. Right. So she's basically getting married again mm -hmm. <laughs> into another family. <laughs> you see, girls, you can have another wedding day if you do it right. I mean, how many weddings can one poor human being have? Right. Um, kangu ya hai. Uh huh. Um. And, and so those processes are very, very important, mm. right? Um, but there was another process that had to be done, Tati, yeah. which added another nku. Mm. So when my father passed away, um, and as you know, when you lose a parent, what we call khutana. Yes. Khutana is basically the, the spirit of being an orphan in the context of death. Absolutely. You've lost a parent, khutana. Mm. The darkness that yes. comes mm. with death and being orphaned by virtue of losing a parent. Mm. So that ritual also had to be done in the midst of all of that. Oh, yes. So I had to... So you couldn't skip any steps that should have or could have happened prior, basically. Yes. So what would have happened is that after my father's passing, that mm. ritual would have had to happen. Mm. So there was another ritual that had to happen involving another nku. Sure. Um, where they perform the ritual, um, they smear me in in a mixture of you know blood and you know uh, different things mm. from the animal, sure. and they smear you, mm. you know, and they shave your head, mm. they shave your eyebrows, sure. they shave your beard, they shave every part of your body, and that's part of the process of hutrosa hutsana, 
Kasi sutu, kasi matoto, how sure. we do things in the family. Mm. So I've got no more debt sure. as far as things that had to be done. Mm. They're all done mm. um, and they're all complete. And I'm, and I'm eternally grateful for that. So Matabi Matoto is my name. Yes, sir. But because I understand that a lot of people still know Mweti, sure. you know, I, I'm okay with that. That is my other name, mm. Labafuke. Yeah. But Omatabi, because you've been bringing people joy anyway. Anyway. And, and, and it's, it's so crazy you say that because it's literally on brand yeah. with everything that I've been doing. And so I, 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 I always argue that a lot of the journeys that we walk are not a coincidence. Mm. I firmly believe. Yeah, yeah. yeah. And, and, so, and so I think everything that has come together, realizing so many other things about my, my grandparents mm. and, and my father, you know, just kind of makes everything fit like a puzzle. Absolutely. And I feel complete mm. um, as a child. Mm. Um, and I know that I have a legacy that I need to build, yes, continue, mm. and pass down. Absolutely. Now, you you're speaking earlier on about how culturally we don't document enough. Mm. We don't share enough. We don't passed on and passed down enough mm. of this is how we do things. Mm. This is who we are as a people. Mm. Um, I'll give you an example. I mean, when you look at the constitution of the Republic of South Africa, they never in their wildest constitutional dreams thought you'd have a situation where you need to impeach a judge, for instance, <laughs> and that judge might want to go to parliament and then what, you know what yeah, I mean? Yeah, yeah, so yeah. there wasn't necessarily enough scenario planning. Mm. I'll tell you where I'm going with this. Mm. So I'll give you another example. So um, the other day, uh, and, and may her soul rest in peace, Tabiso passed away. Mm. Tabiso mm. is my ex-wife mm. of three, four years now. Mm. But we got along. We were great friends. Mm. But for instance, in the African book of how we do things, Never in our wildest nightmares did we think, so what happens when you are now divorced, mm. then someone passes away, mm. but there is still a family connection. Mm. How do you navigate that, yeah. for instance? Yeah. Yeah. So for both our families, it was literally uncharted waters. Yeah. That how do we do this going forward? Because it's never happened on either side of the families. Yeah, yeah. That's true. And I, I, I'm, I'm glad you, you bring that up because... In, even in my family, in the Tiki family, mm. it was often us fetching our children. Yes, <laughs> yes. But I don't think there's ever been a time where somebody had to leave. Mm. But for instance, even when you leave a family in the context of wanting to identify mm. with your father's side of the family, you need to tell your ancestry. Yes. So I had to do that. I had to tell, you know, my Tiki ancestry that, guys, I'm leaving. Mm. Um, and please allow me. And sure. actually... Walk with me. I'm leaving, but this is where I will be. Yes. Yes. And I would like for you to work with those guys there yes. by the Matutlus because sure. we are one thing. Yes. So all these little things. I am of both of you. I am of both of you. <laughs> yeah. So all these little things point out to just how important it is to have um, a sense of what to do. And I think learning about these cultural processes is critical. Mm. You're right. There are many scenarios that pop up. And we don't know what to do. We haven't planned for modern day scenarios. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And even in this case, that you know, just with that example, we had to figure it out. Okay, so do I just leave, or is there something that needs to be done? Exactly. You know what I mean? <laughs> and, 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 and and you almost feel like some things you're having to make up as you go. Yeah. Because no one is sure about what must happen. Yes, yes, yes. And 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 that when you leave um, one family and then. Mm you know, ab absorb into another. Yeah. You need to notify all concerned, Absolutely. living and dead, yeah. that this is where I live. Yeah. This is my house. Mm. This is where I work. These yeah. are my cars. Absolutely. And so all of these things are, are lessons and it's so important to hold. You know, life is so fast, mm. right? And my, my elders always say that, that life, the life we live is so fast mm. and seemingly so complex. And it's almost as if we don't have control, but we've yeah. got to make time to really understand cultural processes. Because one day mm. you're going to be the one asking for somebody else's child mm. in marriage on behalf of your own child. I was laughing at a post that uh, Tebe posted on Instagram. Uh, Tebe is like, never in the history of uncles has there been such a bunch of immature uncles <laughs> such as us. <laughs> <laughs> and, and and the other yeah. day, you know, we, we had a spa Yeah. And I realized um, 
that I'm one of the uncles now. Yeah. <laughs> that, like, Tato, you actually have to be there. That, Tato I'm, one, to win. I'm one of the uncles now. And, <laughs> and luckily, because my dad was... So my granddad was a polygamist. So my dad is the only child of wife number five. Mm. So I've got half brothers and sisters yes, and everything yes. else. So luckily because there's older kids, they are the senior uncles to me. Yes. But yes. I must learn from them. Yes, absolutely. I must learn from them. Yeah, yeah. I'm yeah. like, I'm one of the uncles now. What yeah. up? And, and it's not like there's a handing over ceremony. No. That now in unclehood, this is how you do things. Yeah, yeah. That's why you you need to attend these uh, ceremonies, yes. dispani, yes. and learn there. Yes. And it's also important to understand that in this knowledge sharing process, yeah. there are still things that ha don't have much clarity. Yes. There are a lot of gray areas. Yeah. So there's still a lot of like homework and research that needs to be done. Yeah. Those phone calls that we have to make to the family in Lesotho to, to double check something, yeah. you know, you need to keep doing that yeah. <laughs> or wherever, you know, mm. you guys come from, because essentially that is, that is what it is. And, mm. um, and that's been a realization for me. Sure. Um, but I'm happy that I went through this process, you know, mm. um, I am so, um, moved by the reception that the Matuku family have given me, Sure. you know, in, in really um, making me feel like I was never lost, mm. even that I have to start all over again. Sure. Um, I remember when I went to Lesotho for the Moshuesha walk. It's like uh, an yes. annual walk you, that you they did. You did the Moshuesha walk, yeah. Yeah. Um, so basically what you are retracing the steps Moshuesha, King Moshuesha, and the Basotho took. Yes. Basically. So, so essentially it's retracing the steps that King Moshuesha and his people took from one area, Minghuaneng, mm to Tababusiu, where he eventually settled. Where they settled, yes. And because of that journey, Lesotho was able to exist um, even to this day as a sovereign state. Mm. So without that journey... It wouldn't have happened. It wouldn't have happened. We mm. wouldn't have a Lesotho. Mm. And so there's an annual walk that people are invited to. Why was it important for you to do uh, that walk? Oh, man, I had to walk, Tato. Mm. There's been a lot happening in my life. Mm. Um, a lot of change, a lot of... Um, disappointment, a lot of hurt, a lot mm. of joy. I had to go and walk it all out. Sure. It's a 116 kilometer walk. Mm. It's three days. You're walking through the beautiful terrain of Lesotho, yeah. retracing the steps of possibly your own ancestor. Absolutely. Who might have been there. And mm. so it was such a, a therapeutic, a spiritual journey for me. It wasn't mm. just going to hike. Absolutely. I mean, there were people who do ultra hikes there from yeah. France, the UK, the US, mm. but I was there as somebody who's not even a hiker sure. there for my own reason and my own purpose. You were home. I was home. <laughs> um, and I think the, the journey taught me a lot about being uncomfortable, sure. um, not having nice things around you, mm. having a simple life. Sometimes just being in your own space without there being headphones on or loud music or people asking you for stuff or, you know, drinks rocking up in, on your table in a VIP section. And, and, and surely there's also a symbolism um, in terms of looking at your journey. Yeah. That from the age of 13, 14, 15, mm. your goal was radio. Mm. And that hike is about Ra Tababusiu. Yes. And often the journey is long. <laughs> often you want to give up yeah often you whether you have blisters on your feet or you have uh, emotional blisters yeah half the time walking your purpose 37 degrees yeah not a cloud in the sky sure. not a raindrop yeah. walking through fields mountains mm. you know muipa, horo, sure. yeah you name it right um Burning, sure. sunburnt, mm. thirsty, tired, mm. Mm. guys as big as you mm. crying in pain. Yeah. Mm. You're humbled. You're sure. just like, my word, like, yeah. who do you think you are? <laughs> but because there's an end goal, yeah. you know why you need to keep going. Yeah. And that's what I tell kids all the time. Mm. Have an end goal. Mm. And then you'll figure it out as you go. Mm. But if you don't have an end goal, you're going to hike forever. <laughs> And that's figurative and otherwise. Yeah, and you often won't know where you're going. Absolutely. You won't even you, know you've arrived because you don't know where you're going. Yeah, and the wilderness is very, very confusing yes, if sir. you have no idea where you're going. Absolutely. Yeah. My dude, I think we're going to stop it there. 
Damn. because we're going to do a part two we because have we've run out of time. Yeah. Uh, when you come back, we'll talk about marriage. We'll talk about fatherhood. We'll talk about where to next. We'll yes. talk about uh, learnings along your journey. Dude, your story is incredible. That's why I have you here. Thank you. Uh, I have you here, like I said. Um, I'm doing a series of, I want to talk to people that have impacted me personally. Yeah. Uh, you know, whether it's at a career level, at a personal level. And you've been an inspiration to me in my career. Wow. Because I always say, if there aren't kids as good as you or even better than you, snapping at your heels in your career, you become complacent. Mm. The minute you come, become complacent, you start losing your drive to do the thing that you do. Yeah. So it's, it's, it's kids like you, uh, Cleo, um, 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 Kent, mm. Euphonic, that I believe I've done this as long as I have because I've had you guys in my life. Thank That's you. What, thank that you is why that. I've, I've got you here today. Thank Just to you. say thank you for inspiring me. Mm. Thank you for keeping me on my toes. Mm. And thanks for being an incredible dude. Thanks for being the same. Yeah. And for constantly raising the bar. Sure. Um, I'm not done. You, you have a different level at which you operate. And I think a lot of us mm. uh, that look up to you always say this. Sure. Right? Never late for anything. Mm. Always one structure. Um, thanks for always putting me on. Mm. Thanks for opening the door. I'll never forget the day you said you would take a bullet for me. Sure. When we're doing a shoot for, I think it was Drum Magazine or uh, True Love. We're doing a... For, for Mother's Day. For Mother's Day, yeah. it was myself, you, Euphonic, and yes. our mothers. Exactly. Yeah. And on Guys, that day... our mothers are beautiful. <laughs> All of us. Our mothers are beautiful. And Look. on that day, you said something profound, which I yeah. never, ever thought you would ever say, nor did I have the expectation, because I cannot expect anybody to say that but mm. that for me just deepened my appreciation for you yes, sir. and the role that you played in my life even before we even met mm. even before we met so thank you for that yes, and sir. thanks for having me ladies and gentlemen matabi that's the name right yeah that's it spot on <laughs> uh, the, the thing is i must get it right <laughs> ladies and gentlemen the artist formerly known as mo flavor matabi do, do we keep Tiki though? No, no, no. Tiki, we, we, we put it aside. So there's no double barrel? No, there's no double barrel. Okay, Matutu. Okay. So Matabi, Matutu. Matutu. Yes. Okay. I want to do it now. <laughs> Ladies and gentlemen, Mo Flavor, a.k.a. Matabi, Matutu, is about to leave the building. And we are done. Shout out to More Flavor for hanging out with us. And uh, hopefully you'll tune in for another episode of Wow, What a Week as I continue hanging out with people that have had a positive impact on my life and career. Coming to you from downtown Johannesburg, we are at Amped Studios and are part of the Africa Podcast Network. Shout out Trevor and Pezulu Works for all of the cinematography, cinematography, this English, cinematography. Shout out to Otis the Flo Fraser for all of our imaging and Kelezo Mudisa King, our executive producer. Till next week, have a wow week in spite of yourselves. We're out of here.